point, you can start recording at any time. Okay. Well, um, this webinar is going to be talking about conducting a comprehensive skin assessment. I'm Dr. Karen Volkowski from Montana State University. This is one of your is your largest organ of body. It's up to 15 feet of blood vessels in one square inch. It's the most visible organ of your body, and it's one that we can see if there's any irregularities in it. Hello, me. I'm an associate professor at Montana State University. I'm the executive editor for the Journal of the World Council of Interventional Therapists and editor of the 2014 International Ostomy Guidelines. The editorial board for Ostomy Wound Management and is in skin and wound care. Also, I'm a legal consultant and a former NPUAP board member. In addition, I still do wound rounds, wound dressings, wound care, wound care planning once a month at nursing facilities. We're going to talk about a comprehensive skin assessment. What are attributes of it? Do it. How is separate process? from risk assessment, how created it in our normal workflow, how we met and report the results, prove the process on units, and how we integrate it into care planning. We're going to in-depth skin assessment topics. Please keep a list of any questions you have QI specialists can follow up with you to address them. There's both attributes of a of skin assessment as well as goals of a comprehensive skin assessment. Conduct a skin assessment is really head to toe. But a skin assessment is more than just looking at the skin. You touch the skin. It's the head, the back, every area of the body to understand what you're feeling as well as what you're seeing. We do this is to identify pressure ulcers. We need to find out what is going on? Is my skin are moisture damage? Do we any irritations, rashes, raised moles, or rectors such as our tissue that predispose the person to developing a pressure ulcer? It's important to note that a pressure ulcer that's still will not tolerate the effects of sugar as with normal skin. And there's a full depth wound in skin. It only heal to about 70 to 80 percent of its former tensile strength. So it takes up to a year for the skin to completely heal underneath. Scar looks healed, but really isn't down deep, and it will open up much quicker. And this is really important in terms of planning your care. Look at other skin conditions the person has. For example, if they have vascular issues, vascular wounds, if they had any heart conditions, colectomies. If you have large vessel blockages, you're going to have small vessel blockages, and those are going to affect the skin all over the body. Understand what how do we use to indicate incidence and prevalence for ulcer rates. 
And we really need to understand that a skin assessment helps a fire risk. In other words, regardless of what their risk assessment score is, to have a current pressure ulcer are automatically at high risk of developing more pressure ulcers. And as we identify the needs of the patient, we incorporate that into care planning. We need to look at staff issues. There is a standard protocol in place in and on each unit for a comprehensive skin assessment. Staff needs to understand the parameters of the assessment. And they also need to know what some of the special issues for our bariatric patients. First thing you need to do when you're actually doing the skin assessment is to explain to the patient and family what you're doing, that you're looking at the entire skin, what we're for at the skin, and this is so important. Before you miss the step, important for the family and patient to understand that this is part of the good care that they are receiving at your facility. If something anywhere on the skin, we need to tell the patient and family about it. Assessments always need to be done in a private space. Use, close the door. Make sure no one comes in in the middle, just walks in while you have the patient exposed. The door needs to be comfortable. Address pain issues. So what we're going to need to actually conduct this assessment, before we touch the patient, we can sanitize our hands. Then gloves on, and they become soiled, we need to change them. Once they become soiled, you don't need to change your gloves during the head-to-toe assessment. We want to minimize the exposure of Parts. Now, when we have the gown on, we can take one arm out to look at the abdomen and chest and put the gown back on and pull the covers down to do legs. But in our older patients, they're very cold. So you might want to take in an extra sheet, bath, blanket, towel, something where pulling the covers down, we can actually cover their torso. So to provide a little bit more warmth. So if we are going to need help in patients, have made arrangements to have someone in the room to help us. Stop in the middle to help to turn the patient over is time consuming, very disruptive for the patient. Your facilities policies and procedure in terms of head to toe assessment. You can document how often should it be done. Staff needs to be trained to pay special attention around any devices or comprehensive stocking. Patients come in, and especially our older patients or anyone with limited mobility. And them home with compression stockings. But with them on themselves, they twist them or decide it's too hard and have never taken them off. This can end up doing a great deal of damage. Paley restless can be tubing around or twist stockings or heel boots actually end up causing more damage. Bony senses, including the back of the head, as well as the heel and sacrum, are free the areas where a pressure ulcer develops. So all staff needs to know to pay particular attention to these areas when they're doing anything with the patient. 
In the skin areas, a patient laying on their side, for example, that has one leg on top of the other, or the penis, and a man has a catheter, this is critical that it's checked at least daily. There's been some horrendous pressure wounds develop on people's penis as a result of these catheters. The knees. One leg, are they laying there with their legs crossed? For example, eyes, especially in our very large people, or being folds, at least between the buttocks. And the lighting is like in the room. Sometimes to actually visualize some of these areas well, we need to bring in a flashlight to provide adequate lighting to really see the color of the skin. Look at any area where the patient lacks sensation to feel pain, such as some of the feet in diabetic patients that have neuropathy. Also important to note that more than just diabetic patients can develop neuropathy. Some of our older people can't feel well either. Really look at areas that had a break previously. Because like I told you, these are very susceptible to future breakdown. Patients, if this is an epidural, they can't feel. Patients and sedatives limit its ability to feel the need to turn or shift their body weight. And so we do it for them. And maybe even in some of our healthier people. Maybe in younger people who aren't moving because of fear, they're afraid to move. For example, I had a young woman that worked for, with me a while who required open heart surgery in high school. No one explained to her that she had to move, and she told me how afraid she was and how bad her back and heels hurt because she didn't move. She's afraid if she moved, she'd disrupt any of the tubes and die. Yet no talked to her about this. And she was in pre-med when she started college because of her experience and wanting to make a difference. So it's important regardless of the age to address these issues with our patients. Conducting a skin assessment. We need temperature or firmness, softness of the skin, the color of the skin, the moist level, dry, oily, moist, integrity. Are there areas? Is it intact? Are there rashes? What seeing? These areas need to be assessed. But we need to document on them and we need to teach the staff about them. To look in temperature, you have to touch the skin. Is it warmer or colder than surrounding areas? We see this in patients with wounds. If we feel around the wound, it can feel really hot or really cold indicate skin damage, especially a stage one pressure ulcer or deep tissue injury. So those, these are very hard to see on darkly pigmented skin. So we have to pay particular attention to the temperature and colors in the darkly pigmented skin. It can indicate a pre-ulceration in the diabetic foot. This also can indicate area of inflammation or infection in any part of the body. Turgor is very easy to measure. And certainly nurses' aides and everyone on the team should know how to do this. Finally, your skin returns to its original state. Up, it goes right back to where it was. 
So we like tenting the skin. And the best places to do this is back of the hand. Pin up. If you're healthy, it'll at times be very difficult to pinch. That's healthy and not dehydrated. You can pull it up and it stays up. The person is dehydrated. It tells you with epidermis and the dermis, the layer of skin and the inner layer of skin are attached. And you pull it up, it's really easy to pull up even if it goes right back down. Except the skin is no longer attached. And these people are going to be much more susceptible to skin tear. Simple act of looking at the skin and pinching it can tell us a lot about the patient. It's stiff. It could be of a scar. Different recent areas for skin color. Leg to leg, arm to arm. This area, such as the left leg, look much more red or purple or discolored than the right leg. Does one have bruising on it? Is the see on the buttocks symmetrical? It bruises all over the body. Is the anticoagulants could be causing the bruising? They fallen and not told anyone about it, or is elder or spousal abuse going on? We indicate many skin problems. It could be a pressure ulcer, rash. It can be an or cellulitis. We need to note what these are so we can um, do our care planning that's appropriate for the patient's needs. This can also affect the skin. A vitamin C deficiency. This is purplish blotches on the traumatized areas. Disease can cause a labial fold and eyebrows. Skin, especially important if we're looking for a stage one pressure ulcer. When you're on a reddened area, if it turns white, that means that it's blanchable and at a pressure ulcer. If it white, it's non-blanchable and would be a stage one pressure ulcer. Keep in mind that areas of redness that have been caused by pressure are even blanchable. Take a long time to go away. In fact, three times as long as you had the pressure on. Words, if you cross your legs and you're underneath your top leg after a little while, it's skin and it's red, and, you, and it turns white, that means it will return to normal. But if that pressure was on for 15 minutes, it can take up to 45 minutes for that redness to go away. If it's taking too long, you really need to worry about the blood flow to that area and understand that it would be at very high risk. Look at purple or bruised looking skin. Is it a deep tissue injury with the pressure involved or simply from a fall? Or is it something else? Skin. You that are taking any prednisone or non steroidal medication. That older people or some aged areas, and usually the people that are at very high risk for skin tears. We need planning care to prevent the skin tears and also teaching the people how to prevent them when they go home. Remember, darkly pigmented skin does not blanch, and that's why it's so difficult to pick up stage one pressure ulcers in darkly pigmented skin. 
look at skin color. The color very greatly an area of the body together. Presence on the sacral or buttocks. And a variety of causes. Get the etiology correct to treat it appropriately. Your damage. You need to put creams on to prevent moisture from getting to the skin. But in this area is a pressure ulcer. Creams aren't going to do any good, or vice versa. So we know the cause, so we can appropriate care to that cause. Sometimes when we have moisture, we can have some areas of pressure. And that it's critical for you to identify it so you can know how to treat it or what you want to treat first. Moisture associated skin damage can be dry or wet. In a picture, it's actually a colostomy that we couldn't get, it was so um, pretty much coming out of it that we could dry enough to actually apply the pouch over top of it. So we put a catheter in to slow it down so we could get it cleaned up and add something to stick. And what was happening was the pouch kept coming off and the moisture was getting underneath the wafer and caused skin damage. Extensive maceration damage. The damage can be under skin fold between the legs or behind the knees. So this is what can also occur in areas of high moisture in our bariatric patients. Any of moisture-associated skin damage can obviously be due to incontinence, urine, stool, both. Occur because of wound exudate. That is coming out of the wound, it's running someplace out of the dressing or under the dressing, and skin hasn't been protected. Can be perspiration. You're saying that people have about your fever broke and you start perspiring. Well, people that are running a fever, it's really true, can end up perspiring a lot and the areas get really moist. The moisture prone areas that this occurs in skin fold, yes, in the green, can be quite extensive and lead to a lot of damage. We ought to look between the skin folds in our bariatric patients. And that's often where you need the flashlight to really be able to visualize well. There's products you can use to help keep the area dry. But because these stay so moist, it's an area where you have uh, either or a fungal infection going on. Ostomies or a fit that leaks, people that have developed trauma to their abdominal wall or that have Crohn's can all develop spontaneous fistulas to the skin surface. And it's very difficult to keep the air dry and clean. Know the etiology of the moisture so you treat it appropriately. Look integrity of the skin. It's intact. Intact. That needs to be documented. You're going through reviewing the record. It's disconcerting when you find intact, warm and dry, clean, clear, etc., and all of a sudden you have a stage three pressure ulcer. You see that you had an area of redness. The next days. Choose. And say you have a stage three pressure ulcer. Either one wasn't adequately, just copying page to page to make it look the assessment was done, or a sudden pressure ulcer that develops that be a Kennedy terminal ulcer related to skin changes at life's end. It is not intact. I identify the cause of the problem. Vascular disease, either venous or arterial. 
empathic or diabetic. And a combination of those factors. So you can have a foot with multiple wounds on it, and it can be a combination of pressure with for vascular status related to diabetes. We can tear, especially in the forearms of our older adults. And look at that and how are we going to prevent them? What caused them? They're related. In our patients, we see them falling and they can suffer extensive trauma. Or victims. So we know the etiology. So we treat it and plan care. Do we need to turn them more frequently? Do we need to keep them off this area? Specialty bed. Do we need address? Pediatric patients, we need to look between the skin folds. And skin folds can be very excessive. About having someone come in to help turn the patient, but we might need to have that person come in and actually help us move the skin fold. And to do this in a way that maintains the dignity of the patient. So having the person come in, come in at the beginning to help you, have them step in and say, help me here, help me here, is a lot traumatic for the patient. Then you get their abdomen and say, oh, my gosh, I need help. I can't adequately visualize this. So that's where the planning ahead for needing help certainly comes in. It's difficult to some see between the upper thighs between some of these skin folds. So we have someone simply holding the flashlight and telling the patient, you need to really see, to visualize as well, because the lighting in the room is an adequate main dignity. To look for rashes and maceration, the areas frequently have moist damage. Get whether there's bacterial or fungal infections going on and we look for skin breakdown. We all need to make sure that the staff is aware that we might be putting creams in these areas to fungal infection. What is being used, where it's being used, for any kind of moisture issues in any patient. I'm just rooms, and I'll find four different kinds of, of their creams being used. What is as the level of risk changes or the need changes, they bring something else in. No one knows which one is currently being used. To remove things that aren't being used, we need to put a sticker, identify some way which is the appropriate cream or which cream goes where. Because otherwise, we're not going to have consistency in our planning or our care treatment. So look carefully at the perineum of the bariatric patient. On the area, again, that we can have, find dermatitis or we can find fungal infection. I find things like follicles uh, or sebaceous glands that are blocked and that then develops a pustule in the area. So we need to look at what the cause is because frequently these are then documented as a pressure ulcer when in fact they aren't. Look carefully at the remedies. In patients, there's frequently vascular changes. There can be in lymphedema. Really compare one side to the other and see if one is more edematous or more swollen or has more exudate from the lymphedema on the other side. This caused a lot of tissue damage. Skin assessment is a separate process, not the risk assessment. You have to find the two to adequately plan care. Skin assessment to be a special focus of all the staff. Nurses need to understand how what they're doing ties into the care planning. 
because it's frequently the CNA that finds the skin issue or notices the skin changes because they're the one in there with the patient helping with the bathing, changing them, cleaning them, changing their linen. So for them and anyone on the staff to understand the need to keep us a special focus, it will either improve or work in their medical condition, they unit. You always know what their skin looks like. When they come to your unit, they should have a skin assessment so you know what it looked like when they got there. When they transfer from facility to facility, you need to know what it looks like. So often, I have nursing homes to me. The hospital never told us the person had a pressure ulcer. But when I got here, they had a pressure ulcer. The hospital says that patient to the nursing home, they didn't have a pressure ulcer. But they get back now and they have one. To be able to see when that pressure ulcer really occurred. The pressure ulcer when they left the hospital. Did they arrive at the nursing home? What in the nursing home, obviously if their condition hadn't deteriorated, they wouldn't have gone back to the hospital. But what happened? What was the chance of events? And how can change that? In reality, patients that have really long transportation times on hard surfaces to the hospital or in the room or then in surgery for over an hour likely to be the ones that have a pressure ulcer on admission to an intensive care unit. You need to think about what happened to the patient because it actually can start on the way to the hospital. That's so critical to know what this looks like on admission anywhere in the hospital. And going, it's not one time. The frequency of the skin assessment can be as much as every shift. It could depend on the key of the unit that the person's in. But the nurse has to run in and say, I'm going to do a head to toe skin assessment, top to bottom. It's integrated into other care, so you're doing parts of it throughout the day. So it is newly admitted level of care or discharge should be done head to toe before they leave and document it what you see there, what you see when you get them. So what your policies and procedures are, ensure they're being followed. Time that anyone on the staff on adjust the oxygen the ears, ears of the tubing, you know, that if it's an oxygen mask, where the electric is, need act. Look the ears, look around the ears, being on the oxygen tubing because it can cause a pressure wound under their shoulder. Pointing at things like bowel sounds, you're listening to the patient. Look and fold. Putting the patient in bed. All back of the patient's head as well as the, their back itself. Then and other staff can actually do this as well. When you to lung sounds, shoulders, their back, their sacral coccyx area. And a lot of this is the CAs that are turning the patients them how to do this. We check the catheter, check the penis, and make sure that there are no areas of pressure. That where the um, catheter tubing goes around a leg strap is not too tight. That they're laying on their catheter tubing. I've seen pressure ulcers on the leg and the buttocks area. 
Rebecca from being on the tubing. Pillows under the patient calves. Check the heels and feet. Sliding down in bed can develop a pressure ulcer on the bottom of the foot board. Task to use a small pocket mirror to look at the heels. Teach my older patients, especially, or my bariatric patients, to add an inexpensive hand mirror. Put next to the toilet in the bathroom and sometimes a week to look at her feet. Otherwise, they can't see them. And our diabetic patients, especially, or elderly, can have really large wounds on their feet without ever knowing it. So opportunities for education as well. Small handheld mirror that all staff have can visualize the heels on a regular basis with having to elevate the bed or get down their knees to look up. Teach your staff to also remove the socks to look at the feet every day. I'll come in with support hose or compression stockings, and they know how to put them on correctly. So they either put them on and they're twisted, or then take it off because they didn't know what to do when they've gone home, and they've all uh, caused areas of pressure or compressed the circulant to the feet. So teach staff that socks have to come off for visualization of the feet and heels every day. We sites. Look at the arms and elbows. The wool picture actually developed pressure ulcer on her arm from sitting in the chair all the time and using her arm to push on the the on the chair. Now, a lady who didn't move well, she was receiving chemotherapy. She was confused, and no one was checking her arm, and that's what happened. One is lifted. Check comments on the butt, on the sides, the back foot, or all the frequently develop wounds or pressure ulcers, especially people sitting. When you move any equipment, check the adjacent skin. This includes TENS units, restraints, splints oxygen tubing, and endotracheal tubes. People develop very large pressure ulcers around cervical collars and braces. These are being checked daily. These that we put on people after surgery they are very effective in, in preventing blood clots in the legs, but people move because they have tubing coming off them. So helping one problem we're actually making another problem worse. So keep in mind the effect of any equipment from the patient perspective. Now, how good your gen assessment is, if you document it, you're not going to know you did it. So it's really important to make sure all results are documented by everyone doing it and document it, that they're reported. It can be, you know, in a team meeting. It can be profession to profession. So skin today, and we had, there were no wounds. Skin today, and the dressing was still where it was supposed to be. It was dry. Tronic medical records. We knew if there were no problems as well as what the problems were. And one of the issues that frequently comes up is documentation can go on multiple screens. This can be very confusing to the staff doing the documenting or for some trying to follow what's been going on. Make sure all staff knows where it is documented in the medical records. 
the checklist of screens with the parameters where everything is found. Items of bodies that you can write on as you're doing wound rounds so that you can document it later. But it's important for all staff to know where and how to document results. This includes something for your CNAs to actually put what they looked at and what they, you know, what they found for the nurse to use later in the actual record documentation. One of it in the toolkit is a proper identification. And, and we actually had these made into sticky notes that were small, and we took the CNAs. And we any time you see something on a patient, mark it was, the date, the name, the room number, et cetera, and give it to your nurse. method of communication that everybody knew what it was. It wasn't just casually saying, this is in Mrs. Smith's room today, and this her butt was kind of red. The problem being, if the nurse is in the middle of something, she might oh, okay, I'll go check it. But you have a code, you have new admissions, you have whatever going on, and by the end of the day, you've forgotten to do it. So this is a way for the nurse to say, okay, I checked this, I documented about it. Effective communication tool. Another thing that CNAs have told me when I've done education for them is that often the nurses don't pay any attention to them or discount what they say. This is the effective communication comes in. It's really got to be a team approach. Everyone needs to know how to report issues to the other person without fear of sanction. Keeping in mind that unit culture is an important piece and having a way of communicating is critical to providing good care. Thing that has been tried and is effective and you've got to know your policies and procedures to know how much of this you can or can't do. For every patient, have it documenting the day they were checked and whether or not they had a pressure ulcer. If pressure ulcer, then the individual sheet in the notebook then tells where it is, the of it, if it's a pressure ulcer, what stage, how if there's multiples, all the stages information about them, treatment for any wound. Some abilities have actually gone so far as to one week, they put a pair for each wound in the documentation sheet or on it. You have a camera. One on the staff can see exactly what the treatment orders are for each wound. And it's easy then for the wound team to page to page and you can see if the wound is improving or deteriorating. Melodies allow out so the wound. That's why you need to know your policy and procedure. You also would need to know where the book was because each unit tends to put things in the middle. Anytime there's new staff coming in, they need to be told what policies and procedures are, where this book would be, what they'd be doing, because it can be very unit specific. Sure, the results of the skin assessment is reported in the shift changes. It's ignored just because the skin is normal. If the pet has a wound and there's dressing on it, that dressing frequently is only changed every two to three days. So it is day number two, it doesn't get changed until tomorrow. That's to be reported to the next shift. The drain was clean and dry. It is to be changed tomorrow. The way for that next shift to also, if something happens and it falls off or becomes saturated, what are the orders? And so having a place where they're kept up to date becomes very important. 
if found, report it to the health care provider and others of the team, including as well as the next shift. Is found, then they will also be reported. The person's skin was warm and dry. No the areas were found. Needs part of that standard report that you just get in the habit of and don't even have to think about. If it can keep a log, then review the log on a regular basis. The comprehensive skin assessment was done for each patient. It's a good way for the QI person to be sure that the best practices are being done. Minimum orders are current that aren't outdated for patients. It should know the incidence and prevalence rates. Unit, they should know why they matter and they should know where they're posted the differences between prevalence and incidence. Some information can be found in the toolkit. Staff is very clear on who is going to be in charge of that comprehensive skin assessment. It's going to be reported. So they examine the skin and they clean or reposition the patient. Nurse knows that she needs to document it to understand how critical this is for good care and, frankly, for preventing lawsuits in the future. Everyone needs to know when and why it should be conducted as well as how to conduct it and responsibilities are. New staff either knows anyone who's just learning should feel threatened when they want to ask questions or they feel unsure. If you call a new nurse or a new CNA to go and assess the skin, you know how comfortable they are actually doing it. Encouraging peer mentoring. Let me help you. You. I, when I go into facilities, if I go in and do it first and watch with me, and then the next time I watch them, one of the most effective ways for them to learn without feeling threatened, people feel very confident in their skills, prevents errors. In people to ask questions with being made to feel fit. Often ask because they're afraid that it's going to think it's just that they're not knowledgeable and, you know, they might be ridiculed. Feel very comfortable reporting these skin abnormalities. And it's very much a unit culture measure they need to work on. Planning the assessment along with the risk assessment reasons the care plan. The person of moisture issues that they have pressure ulcer. What are we going to do? do it. How do we turn them? Where do we turn them? How do they get up? Up. Do we need a dietary consult for them? Or all the care planning questions that need to be asked and addressed? One, we do the other. Okay, done. We need to make sure that the staff is comfortable then reading these to the actual care. Well, kit is a whole diagram of how to do skin assessment and care planning. The head to toe skin assessment pulled from it. In other words, we knew both. We document it. 
need to report any of these abnormalities to the healthcare provider. The piece that's often overlooked is that we need to educate the patient and the family on our findings. If we find something, tell them. When we were turning your mother today, we noticed her bottom was a little red. When I'm actually looking at a pressure ulcer on the foot or the bottom, I actually ask my cognitively intact patients that want to see it. And I take a picture into them. I discard a picture so I don't take it out of the facility. But I often show it to them and say, here's what I found out and what we're doing about it, and here's what you can do about it to help me. It's a very powerful tool, and it keeps patients and face from feeling like we're hiding something from them. Assessment and care planning diagram, that's tool 3A in your toolkit. Understand they both go together. It's not very separate processes. I talked about our attributes and goals of comprehensive skin assessment. We know to conduct the comprehensive head-to-toe skin assessment is a separate process. We talked about integrating the skin assessment into normal workflow, implementing and reporting and results. To improve comprehensive skin assessment skills, and being associated with it to work with all staff in all these measures. Thank you, such great listeners. I know you're going to have questions, and we certainly can refer any of those to your QI specialist. We also have a list of resources at the end, as well as the specific information in your toolkit. Thank you so much for listening today, and I hope you go out there and really conduct some good assessments and do a good job of training your staff. Okay, <laughs> questions? Thank you, Karen. That was great. A very great presentation. Um, and I did it again. I do it, you know, it would never come out the same. No, of course not. Of course not. But it's a it's a great amount of content um, that's going to be really helpful to the hospitals. Um, so, are there questions that anybody wants to ask? Um, we should probably let uh, um, folks unmute themselves if they have a question or two that they want to ask. Remember um, too that we'll be following up with you to generate a list of okay. questions and uh, answers um, to those common questions that we know people will ask. Does anyone on the line have a question that they want to ask? Good job that you had no questions or you all fell asleep. No, 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 no. Not at all. <laughs> Good guy there. A lot of information. So, um, I go really well with the video. Oh, so I think um, 